number of years, the former Gaumont Palace at Lewisham was the largest cinema to remain open as a single unit in London. It too was the work of W. E. Trent, and yet again the emphasis was on broad horizontal bands. The main front was faced with cream-coloured slabs of marble terrazzo, enlivened by eight horizontal projecting bands of blue and gold mosaic. The lower part was in polished black terrazzo, and this material was also used in the two columns supporting the lintel over the large window of the cafe. A permanent neon sign was placed between the top two projecting bands, spelling out the name of the cinema while smaller neon lit letters were positioned across the slabs lower down to announce the current film and stage attraction. This was a tasteful but far more expensive alternative to large posters. Originally opened on the 12th of December 1932, the Gaumont Palace was considered to be the showplace of South East London and many patrons travelled a great distance to see the spectacular stage shows that accompanied its film programmes. Presentation at the Gaumont Palace was said to have been excellent and set a standard that the rest of the circuit endeavoured to copy. The warm texture of the brick auditorium walls was relieved by tall windows. These were to convey the impression of spaciousness that the cinema would have within. The main entrance foyer was bright, cheerful, yet dignified and refined. The walls were lined with polished macassar and walnut wood, surrounding typical Gaumont British display cases. The floor was terrazzo divided by black marble and brightly coloured mosaic bands. On each side were queuing spaces, a broad flight of stairs led to the circle and on either side were entrances to the stores. All this was swept away in the name of modernization. Shown here on October the 29th, 1973, the main foyer has been considerably reduced in size and there are no longer queuing spaces, nor even the need for them. The 200-seat cafe was immediately above the entrance foyer. In 1932, it was possible to obtain lunch for one shilling and sixpence, a fish or meat tea for one and threepence, and a three-course supper, again, for one and six. Later, the cafe became a Victor Sylvester dancing studio, and when that failed, bingo. On entering the cinema circle, it is obvious how dramatically and skillfully the architect has impressed himself on the vast space available. There was stepping down of the ceiling in broad curving sections with fronts that originally contained indirect lighting. This used to be the main source of illumination. The ceiling is stepped up in a series of broad curves radiating from the proscenium opening. These curves connect with the columns that support the seven tall arches on each side wall, beyond which are wide steps leading from the circle to ground floor exits. From the vaulted roofs of the aisles, formed by the side arcades, hung fittings which gave a warm and rosy light. On a part of the Gaumont Palace at Hammersmith, the sweep of the circle was immense and seated over 1,300 people. Total seating for the theatre was 3,300, which made it the biggest cinema ever designed by Gaumont's chief architect, W. E. Trent. At each end of a corridor at the back of the stalls were two unusual features. These were two circular crush rooms, or rotundas, where patrons could wait for seats when the stalls were full. Two more rotundas fulfilled a similar function for the circle, occupying part of the space beneath it. The superb proscenium was 54 feet wide, and as the focus of vision, the proscenium arch was treated more richly than the remainder of the theatre with a clustered columnar frame in silver and blue. The proscenium curtains were carried out in graduated shades of orange silk, 
slightly parted in the middle to reveal an inner curtain with two painted figures on it, inviting the attention of the audience to the mysteries behind the curtain about to be revealed for their entertainment. The stage measured 85 feet in width and was 36 feet deep. The grid was 75 feet above the stage floor and there were 12 dressing rooms. The projection room was placed high up behind the back of the circle. Here, completely isolated from the auditorium and never seen by the public, was the heart of the theatre, still using the Gaumont British mats that had been part of the original furnishings. In the end bays, adjacent to the proscenium opening, stood two sculptured figures by Newbury A. Trent, a cousin of the architect, representing the senses of sight and sound, awakened and stimulated by the film. The magnificent auditorium, which was one of W. E. Trent's best designs, remained remarkably unaltered. From the stage, one cannot but be impressed by the scale of the building. The balcony swung round in a vast unbroken sweep of 180 feet from side to side. On each flank, the tall columns and arches supported the roof. The fluted features grew gradually from the columns and added to the feeling of lightness and grace, besides giving an additional feeling of support to the ceiling. Nothing had been introduced to distract attention from the stage but every effort had been made to create the atmosphere of pleasure, restfulness and comfort which was fitting for the proper reception of the picture on the screen. Sightlines were excellent from every part of the auditorium. There was none of the pressure often found in high capacity cinemas to squeeze in every last seat. No modern cinema theatre was complete without an organ and one by the famous firm of John Compton had been installed that would rise from the middle of the orchestra pit. The Gaumont closed after serious fire damage on the 27th of February 1962 and reopened after renovation as the Odeon on the 29th of July 1962. The Odeon, nay Gaumont, was shut and shuttered in 1981. Since then it has remained derelict.